All right, hi everyone, welcome. We'll just wait a couple minutes here to get started and give folks a chance to log on. Um, I'll just share some info about some upcoming events. Um, of course, we have the rest of our speaker series events each Wednesday through the end of March. Those take place from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Uh, next week, we have a really exciting conversation um, happening called Community Collaborations, Alaska Native Artist Revitalization, and that talk features Sven Hawkinson and Alfred Namoff. They are both Supiak, and they were actually both scheduled to speak at last year's speaker series, but sadly their event was canceled due to the pandemic, so we're really excited to welcome them back in a virtual format. Um, let's see, all of our speaker series events will be available on our YouTube channel alongside our previous speaker series events. And our first event, Making Medicine, Absalaga Conversations on Land, Water, Culture, and Art is actually already posted on our YouTube channel. So if you missed it, or if you just want to watch it again, it is there for you. Um, looks like some folks are logging on here. So just another minute or so. Uh, we also have an event coming up tomorrow um, as part of the Creative Thought Forum. The title for that event is Republic of Lies, How Conspiracy Theories Took Over American Public Life. Um, that's taking place tomorrow from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. You can visit our website to register for that event. All right, it looks like the numbers are climbing here. Um, oh, and Molly just um, included the link for our YouTube channel here in the chat. So if you want to watch any of those uh, videos I mentioned, you can visit that link. All right, it looks like we have a good number of folks signed on here. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Felicia Garcia. I am the Curator of Education at SAR's Indian Arts Research Center. Uh, this is the second event in this year's IERC speaker series. And as Alicia Poon, IRC Director mentioned in our last event, the School for Advanced Research is located on Tewa land in Okapoge, which means white shell water place. Surrounding our campus are the landscapes of Pueblo, Apache, and Navajo communities whose people continue to maintain vital connections to this place. As an institution privileged to steward indigenous cultural material and committed to uplifting indigenous voices, we strive to maintain respectful and mutually beneficial relationships with these communities. So we not only honor the ancestral stewards of this land, but celebrate their past, present, and future. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge and celebrate the recent appointment of Deb Holland from Laguna Pueblo as the first Native American Secretary of the Interior, such an exciting achievement. Before we begin, also just a reminder that we recently launched a new membership option that welcomes you all into our online programming at SAR. Our virtual memberships offer new members a way to get involved for just $25 a year. You can also always make a donation. Your support helps keep SAR's online programs accessible and free of charge to a broad and diverse audience. And Molly will be dropping the link to sign up for memberships and donate in the chat as well. I will be moderating a Q&A once the speakers have completed their presentation today. So please type any questions or comments that you have in the chat box on the right. You can ac access that chat box by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. So let's get started. The title of today's talk is A New Era for Indigenous Art and Museums. In September 2020, Larger Than Memory, a groundbreaking exhibition of contemporary indigenous art opened at the Heard Museum in the midst of a global pandemic. For today's event, we will be hearing from curator Aaron Joyce in conversation with featured artist Ian Kuali'i, who was a 2019 Dubin Fellow, and Marie Watt, as they explore the potential roles of artists in exhibition development and how this type of collaboration can change the way that museums function. Speakers will also share a bit about the impact of the pandemic on the exhibition and whether their practices will shift to be more virtual moving forward. I am so happy to introduce curator and scholar of contemporary art, Erin Joyce. Joyce has organized over 30 solo and group exhibitions for museums, galleries, and project spaces. Her writing on art and visual culture has been published in Hyperallergic, Salon, and Canvas Magazine, and was a 2019 Rapkin Prize nominee. 
Her recent exhibitions include Larger Than Memory, Contemporary Art from Indigenous North America, David Hockney's Yosemite and Masters of California Bas Basketry, Maria Hupfield, Nine Years Towards the Sun, and Still Life Number Three, Raven Chacon work, um, and Raven Chacon, sorry about that. Work as a curator has garnered attention from Vogue Magazine, The New York Times, The Art Newspaper, and Wide Walls. Joyce holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of North Texas, and she studied contemporary art at Sotheby's Institute of Art, London, and has a Master of Arts in Museum Studies from Johns Hopkins University. And Erin will be introducing our other guests, Ian Kuli'i and Marie Watt. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Erin Joyce. Thank you so much, Felicia, for that introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me um, to be part of this discussion. It's so lovely to be able to share stories about the work that we do as curators um, and culture workers and to be able to uh, be joined by Ian and Marie is really wonderful as well. So thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge first that the Heard Museum where I'm calling in from sits on Akamo Atham and Holchidam Peeposh land. And we would like to thank them as our neighbors, hosts and friends. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and invite Ian and Marie to turn on their cameras and that way you can kind of have a face to the name when I'm reading their bios. Uh, so if you let, excuse me while I put my glasses on so I can actually read these. <laughs> Uh, Marie Watt is an American artist and citizen of the Seneca Nation with German Scott ancestry. Her interdisciplinary work draws from history, biography, and Iroquois proto-feminism in indigenous teachings. In it, she explores the intersection of history, community, and storytelling. Through collaborative actions, she instigates multi-generational and cross-disciplinary conversations that might create a lens and conversation for understanding connectedness to place, one another, and the universe. Watt holds an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale University. She also has degrees from Willamette, uh, sorry, Willamette University and the Institute of American Indian Arts. And in 2016, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from Willamette University. She has attended residencies at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and the Vermont Studio Center, and has received fellowships from Anonymous Was a Woman, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Harpo Foundation, and the Ford Family Foundation, as well as the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. Marie serves on the board of Voices in Contemporary Art and on the Native Advisory Committee at the Portland Art Museum, and in 2020 became a member of the Board of Trustees at the Portland Art Museum. She's a fan, she is a fan of Crow's Shadow, an indigenous founded printmaking institute located in the homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla, as well as the Portland Community College. Selected collections include the Seattle Art Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Albert Knox Art, Art Gallery, Yale University Art Gallery, Crystal Bridges Museum, the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of the American Indian and Renwick Gallery, as well as the Tacoma Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum and the Portland Art Museum. She is represented by PDX Contemporary Art in Portland, Oregon, Greg Cusera Gallery in Seattle and Mark Strauss Gallery in New York City. Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Now we have the privilege of being joined by Ian Kuli'i. Ian is a multidisciplinary self-taught artist of Hawaiian and Apache ancestry. His career spans two decades working in murals, large scale cut paper, prints and site specific installations. While trying to simplify his technique as a graffiti writer, he discovered stenciling and realized an appreciation of the cut more than the paint, thus finding his preferred medium of hand cut paper. From a single sheet of paper using an X-Acto blade as his tool, his hand-cut paper portraits, journal entries, and scenes are masterfully rendered with a blend of loose urban contemporary techniques and collaged found materials. He describes his creative process as the meditative process of destroying to create. His work is a balance between the rough and the delicate while exploring ideas of modern progress, biodiversity, and the foundation of one's own history. So again, thank you both for joining me today on this conversation. And thank you so much to SAR and Felicia and Molly for organizing this. It takes a lot of work and we're all, even though we're a year into this pandemic, I think still adjusting to um, Zoom realities. Um, so thank you again. Uh, Molly, can you please pull up the PowerPoint? 
and we can have some visual aids so you don't have to just look at <laughs> look at us. So as uh, Felicia said in her uh, introduction of the talk today, I'm the co-curator for an exhibition that we hosted here at the museum uh, last September and it was up until January of this year. And it was a, a group exhibition of contemporary indigenous artists from the United States and Canada, um, about 24 artists and collaborators of which Ian and Marie were both uh, in that exhibition. So I thought to kind of just start out, we kind of familiarize the audience who may be new to your practices and hear a little more directly from the two of you. So Marie, for those who are new to your practice, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your approach uh, to art making and collaboration? Sure. Um, my approach to art making uh, is both uh, solitary and collaborative. And the, collabor the collaborative element really began in around 2003 when I started working with um, commonplace sort of wool blankets. And I was finding these blankets at thrift stores and I started um, I purchasing anything that was under $5. And I knew I wanted to make a column of folded and stacked blankets that that might kind of be reminiscent of um, like blankets stacked in a linen closet um, that would have uh, maybe a conversation with Brancusi's endless column. As a indigenous person growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I was um, inspired by the Coast Salish totem poles in, of this region, as well as just the conifer trees. And so I um, started kind of gathering these blankets and I really quickly realized that not only were blankets important to me as a, a person whose community gives away blankets to honor people for being witness to important events in life, but I also started realizing that people friends would come and they'd see these blankets amassing in my studio, which at the time was at my house. And, and they'd say, oh, I used to have a blanket like that. And they'd sort of break into like a story talking about a grandparent or someone um, very special in their lives. And so I started to realize that blankets were markers for memory and story and um, also uh, gave more thought to how we're really received in this uh to this world in a blanket and in many ways we depart in a blanket and i think my collaborative work has really been about um considering how to uh um be in conversation with these stories so it started with maybe putting a, a book out where people could share a blanket story in the context of seeing a sculpture and then it later led to inviting people to contribute a blanket to build a sculpture and and I'd trade a print for that contribution, but then people would share a story as well. And then um, there were sewing circles too, but I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> and the piece that's in um, the exhibition, actually, could we move forward in the slides and I may have put the slides out of order. Um, so we might have to go forward and, and come back. Um, but yeah, just a couple more. There we go. Um, so the piece that's in the exhibition, uh, Companion Species Field, uh, this was from 2017, I believe, or 2018. I forgot to write down the date, and it's been a while since I wrote the label copy for it. Um, but these are a very specific type of blanket. Um, you know, they're old army blankets, you know, sort of various shades of green. For you, when you were working on this piece um, in specificity, was it the, the the tactile quality of these blankets that really drew you in first, or was it their, their sort of history and story as, as army blankets? You know, I, for, for me, it was really the, the history and story of army blankets. Uh, and as a kid, my parents had this old, I would say, kind of um, a, an old station wagon that wasn't very well insulated, and so it was often cold. And so the blankets uh, were always, the army blankets were always in this station wagon. They came from an army surplus store. Uh, we would cover up with them if we went skiing and were coming back home from the slopes. Uh, my parents would use it to them to change a tire. Uh, we would picnic on them. My sister and I would build forts with them. 
But one of the things that happened as I realized that blankets um, were storied objects is there was a moment in my work with blankets where I actually avoided working with army blankets because I really wanted to understand the story of, um, of people who serve and veterans uh, more. And so it took me a while to kind of come around and, and make uh, a work. It was actually called Edson's Flag in which um, it honored my uncle's service, but also the service of, of veterans. And, and that sort of released me um, from uh, my, con I like my, the initial concerns I had about using army blankets. I thought, it, I realized it became, or was important to share these blankets and, and honor veterans stories, even though I might not know the exact story attached to a particular blanket. So the other thing that I really am drawn to with army blankets is I think of them as these, ob these uh, objects that are sort of landscape-like. Um, they're designed in a way to uh, conceal one's identity in the environment. And in this particular piece, the army blankets are all these kind of um, scrap blankets that I've used in previous projects. And I started to kind of put them together to create this large field. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think a, another thing that when you're talking about blankets as these storied objects, which they really are, I mean, once you really start to think about it, they are these these containers of memory almost where you, they hold so many stories from our past and you know both stories of comfort and both stories of loss and this piece you know talking about stories this piece also has a narrative about communication um, and you know I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about the the figure of the dog and the the tongue and this idea of openness to communicate yeah so I mean for the last few years, I've really been thinking about um, my relationship to animals, and that grows out of the Seneca uh, creation story in which Sky Woman uh, falls from a hole in the sky, and she is assisted by animals uh, as she lands on what we now refer to as Turtle Island, and she's helped by birds, and she's helped by four-legged animals. And as a result, our, in our community, we consider animals our first teachers, and our clans are animals as well. And so um, I'm from the turtle clan, and I started thinking about how is it that um, we as um, hu like humans in this moment, how can we start to remember our relatedness, not just to one another, And so I've been thinking about this like companion relationship that we have, uh, and I've been looking at a lot at dogs. And in this particular piece, um, I thought that it was really important to share this dog's um, tongue because it's our, like I uh, had seen this painting actually by John Singer Sargent, and I'm going to forget it's the, the painting's name. Hopefully it will come to me at some point. But the thing that struck me in this portrait, there was this dog in the in the um, in kind of the background. But the, and the only thing you could see was its tongue. It was a black dog, and it was a black ground, and this tongue just sort of um, was like um, like kind of falling out of its mouth, correct? And and it I when I saw that tongue, I really thought of how uh, it was an. Uh, of our relatedness, right? This mm -hmm. dog has this tongue and I have this tongue. And, and I think the thing that's so important to me when I think about now tongues is that, you know, our, our tongues uh, are uh, something that allow us to speak and uh, they allow us to speak out um, for, for uh, other um, animals and entities in the universe that can't speak up for themselves. Absolutely. Well, and the, 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 the techniques you use in the piece of the embroidery itself, you've got these um, sort of very loose hash marks that are making up the body of the, of the dog and then these very tight textural uh, French knots that make up the tongue. Um, they're just, you know, just from a, a visual point of view and a tactile point of view. I'm sure we had a lot of people in the gallery that wanted to touch it. Um, but it's just, you know, there's a, a very luscious quality to it um, that I think people really grabbed onto. Um, and I think it's especially now with 
with COVID and not being able to to touch objects or or to embrace each other, there's this tension with the piece almost that you know this this desire to experience it tactically, uh, but not being able to for many reasons. Obviously, we wouldn't want people to touch it, <laughs> um, regardless of of the pandemic. But it's just such a such an astounding work. And if you'll go back one slide, uh, Molly, this is uh, it took. Uh, quite a few people to get this up on, not on the wall, it was suspended from the ceiling. Um, but we had, we have a, a fellowship program here at the museum um, through the Mellon Foundation. And so we had our Mellon Fellows kind of help guide it up onto the wall as our preparators. And I will say that was, it was very challenging to install a, a large exhibition while socially distancing, <laughs> um, you know, because it's hard to get big things up on the wall when you're not supposed to be very close to others. And um, so it was definitely created a nimbleness uh, between preparators and curators and, and artists. And, and speaking of installing, um, if we can go back to some of Ian's pieces, uh, we had you fly out here um, to install your work. So you had two bodies of work in the exhibition. You had the site-specific murals, and then um, a smaller group of, of hand-cut paper pieces. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing right here? This is the monument pillar installation. Right, so um, I believe these were, were they 23 or 24 feet in height? 26. Uh, roughly, in, in like 12 feet wide. Um, so, um, on the left hand side, you see a, a portrait of um, a monument in Hawaii of King Kamehameha III, um, who was a monarch in the Kingdom of Hawaii, um, actually wrote uh, the constitution for the Kingdom of Hawaii and our Bill of Rights. Um, also did the great uh, Mahele, which was the land division, which divided up the lands uh, that were once specifically just belonged to um, the, the crown, they were crown lands, uh, split it up so the maka'aina na, um, or the commoners and the ali'i, or uh, konahiki, um, the like more chiefly or governing lines had access to lands as well too. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have an inverted Captain James Cook, um, who, you know, it's like more so about like the, com just the conversation of, um, of equity um, and representation of individuals, especially, um, you know, on indigenous land, which is, this is all pretty much indigenous land, right? Um, in Hawaii, you know, there was uh, this constant conversation um, in regards to, uh, you know, our high schools being named after, say, like McKinley, President McKinley, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, multiple, you know, uh, plaques and, and monuments to individuals such as Captain James Cook, but very little representation um, for the longest time in, you know, prime locations, um, unless it was like uh, Duka Hanamoku or something, you know, on Waikiki Beach, you know, to, mm -hmm. to appease the, the, the lens of like the tourists, you know, like surf, Hawaiian surf culture, you know, in, on Waikiki. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I wanted to I wanted to create a piece that sort of had that conversation um, going on. Um, well, and I think that it's you know the the sort of cultural backdrop of of last year and this interrogation of the institution of monument making. To your point mm -hmm. of you know who's creating these monuments, who's the audience that they're potentially supposed to serve or potentially supposed to intimidate. Um, you know, so creating this where you're very much shifting the perspective, you're turning Captain Cook on his head, I think really encourage the viewers to consider um, what those monuments mean and, and how they uh, function in different communities. Right. I mean, you know, our people did more than just turn Captain Cook on his head. To yeah. Israel, you know, <laughs> exactly. like, um, you know, so, you know, it's like a, it's, it's a discussion that we've had forever in Hawaii um, in regards to these things. And even, you know, the, the work that my sacred mother, Carolyn Kuli'i has done, um, you know, uh, her early days with uh, Kalahui Hawaii, 
um, and trying to, well, getting treaties signed between our Hawaiian sovereign group, sovereignty group and say California uh, tribes that were wishing to be like federally recognized. And then the conversation around Father Sarah, you know, representing, you know, the whole mission system in California. And a lot of those tribes are like the, like conversations with the Ahashiman and even like the Shumash, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and all, you know, all the other tribes that represent um, California as well that were directly affected by the mission system. Um, that conversation um, has always been had um, in my household. And uh, my mother um, was part of a group of individuals before um, like this more recent push to, you know, bring down monuments or have the discussion around them uh, was part of this group of individuals in San Francisco um, spearheaded by um, Barbara Mumby and uh, Ohlone community members in San Francisco to remove a super problematic portion of um, the last, it was called the last or early days uh, portion where it basically showed a, a, a priest and a frontiers individual, um, you know, subjugating an indigenous individual. And it was right in front of like city hall in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there had, again, been that discussion for the longest time of like, you know, uh, of removing, removing that monument. Um, and uh, they did, they removed it. And then they, um, it coincided with the 50 year anniversary of, of Alcatraz, the Alcatraz occupation, um, Indigenous Peoples Day. And so they, um, they did this grand uh, citywide, you know, uh, exhibition and, 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 uh, and campaign for um, visibility of indigenous individuals that you know live in in San Francisco, both the Ohlone individuals and the individuals that um, you know were part of like the relocation you know history as well of San Francisco and Oakland. Um, so yes, yeah, I mean I'm you know I'm uh, personally like super proud of these works. I wish I could do more large scale versions of them you know um, around the so called United States. Absolutely. Well, and this work, just um, sort of materially, we ended up not doing them in paper because of the scale. They're, like you said, they're 26 by 12 and some odd change. Um, yeah. And we couldn't find paper wide enough uh, to, well, to fit that. Right. I mean, we, 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 I, we could have done it in paper, but I think for me, it was more so about I mean, that discussion that we had with um, my original process would be to use spray adhesive in large mm -hmm. format That's paper right. to let things out and then draft it out and then cut and extract. Mm -hmm. um, and then naturally, because it being a museum, there's, you know, certain compromises that have to be made, like sure. no propellant, no aerosol, you know, yeah. um, it would have been a huge sticky aerosol <laughs> mess all over the place. So yeah, um, this was definitely, um, it, I had done, um, smaller pieces before in in vinyl. Um, this is definitely the largest to date. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I actually truly enjoyed um, using this material. The one thing I I um, I always um, go back to is the fact that it is vinyl, though. So it's like a a material that's super detrimental to the environment, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to be super super conscious about my approach to my art practice now like for sure. i want to start moving moving away from using even milled paper you know yes. um and my people have a rich history of kappa of cloth paper making you know from mm -hmm. mulberry so and then even like traditional dyes so i can you know do other things and then you know so like step away from from more of these uh these or materials produced yeah totally. for sure totally. Totally. well and i mean to to that conversation, Marie, your practice is so um, centered around taking objects that are already existing and manipulating them and reworking them. Um, I'm assuming that's one of your pieces behind you in your studio, um, you know, and that idea of sort of reclaiming and reworking things into a new manifestation or a new existence is so important, as you said, the vinyl or even aerosols or things like that, that can be detrimental to, to the world we live in. Um, I think we have um, a video, a time-lapse video. 
Um, if Molly, if you still are able to pull that up. It also may be a little loud on, um, oh, so yeah. <laughs> more like check their, totally check your volume and everything um, as it plays. Yeah, we move we gonna go 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 we Kumu aina na na mahele ka awale na moku Moku ke ahula wai akahi i oki e kuka na loa Pauku na aina na moku moku ka ohi kapua ka na loa O au mea manu ka ikele omo ike hekala ni nana e noho Noho kula ni awa i a ola ola o kalana ola ola Ke ali iki kauna ola ki kilo ki kaua Noho awa i alu lana kanim opu na ikawa e omo kawa ika moku Omo ike haki ali ii So that was Ian working very quickly, <laughs> which also <laughs> very, very quick. <laughs> when you were here, I guess it was, I can't remember if it was, I guess, early August um, or July. Right. It was, well, it was very hot in Phoenix in the summer. Um, but, but it wasn't hot in, indoors. That's true. It's always like 72 degrees <laughs> right. at the museum. Um, but it, we, I think we were all, you know, in terms of like my co-curator and I and the the prep staff, we were all really stunned with how quickly the process went. Um, you know, we were thinking, oh, he'll probably, you know, be working on this like all week and you were done in like three days. So we we're like, yeah, I mean, you know, to quote like hip hop icon KK Rockwell, you know, ain't nothing to it but to do it, you know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, like if you're committed to something like just get up there and, and try to knock it out. I also wanted to challenge myself, you know, mm -hmm. I think we had the conversation where you're like, do you need food? Do you need to take a break? And I'm like, my reward. And we talked about this earlier too, Maria. I was yeah. like, you, well, you're eating lunch. You know, I'm like, once once this is all done, my reward will be the meal. My reward yeah. will be, you know, uh, getting that drink of water or using the restroom. Or what yeah, you were on the, on the lift for like eight hours. <laughs> Everyone yeah, was like, I mean, are you okay? <laughs> I think like, you know, it was, yeah, the total amount of time for both pieces, you know, um, was realistically no more than like 24 hours, you yeah. know, like total, total time to complete those two. And so, yeah, I mean, I always, I mean, especially when it comes to, uh, I challenge myself with like the visual language to begin with, you know what I mean? And the history, but then like, there's this, the physical side of it as well, like the endurance thing, like mm -hmm. putting myself through it. Like even when I do like my earthworks and like land prayer, mm -hmm. you know, pieces, it's, it again has to do with like, offering up self and like that idea of endurance and challenge, you know. For sure. Yeah. And Marie, for pieces at the scale of, and maybe it, maybe this is a stupid question, but for pieces that are such large scale, these sort of monumental textiles, what's the sort of time footprint for you when you're working on something of that magnitude? <laughs> you know, it, it really depends on the project. I would say that that particular piece took um, quite a long time to, to finish, but sometimes it's faster. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's motivated by like a, a deadline. Uh, often it's always motivated by a deadline. To motivate. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I think that, I mean, but they are labor intensive mm -hmm. pieces. I mean, one thing I saw, like in watching that install, time-lapse install of Ian's piece that I thought we both had in common though, like with that labor and effort is also just this sense of ritual or the meditation that comes with mm -hmm. working like that. Sometimes in my studio, um, there, there might be more than 
like a few hands working on something or many hands working on mm -hmm. something if it if especially if there's like a quicker turnaround For sure. so there's that element of um of like kind of joint labor but also com also community too mm -hmm. right uh, well and speaking about community sewing circles as you mentioned briefly earlier are part of your practice uh for our viewers who may not know how those function with your artistic practice um what does that look like what's that process like is it you know an I've been for anyone <laughs> I remember meeting Ian at a sewing circle <laughs> uh Ian you want to tell how what was yeah well, I'll, I'll lay it out and you can tell me what your experience was in the sewing circle um, so <laughs> I had actually been a artist in resident at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, MOCNA, mm -hmm. in Santa Fe. And I was hosting a sewing circle at the, um, the magazine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Southwest Contemporary. Yeah, so now Southwest Contemporary. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so at that particular event, like I like to set up a, a long, a long continuous table. And um, and I would say like, I, I think of these sewing circles as this event where I invite people to come, no sewing experience is necessary. You can come go as you wish. You can bring friends uh, when possible, I'll feed you. Uh, I like to honor uh, the exchange of stitches with uh, by giving you a small print and, um, and, 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 and then people just sort of you know, show show up, and uh, I like to say I set the table, and then what happens at the course of that event really depends on you know the participants um, who define where it goes. But uh, I pre-thread all the needles, and panels are oftentimes sort of um, pre-arranged so people are invited just to kind of um, stitch um, around tape that has pa patterned out a word, for example. And then um, they can stitch around the tape or over the tape or left or right of the tape, but not through the tape. In the particular sewing circle that Ian was involved in, I was actually inviting people to write the word mother mm -hmm. um, in, uh, they could write the word mother or write the word mother in their own language. And so that's what people were stitching. But the other thing that was really important to me about that piece is that people were writing in their own hand. And I'm really mm -hmm. interested in, um, like how is it that our hand and like how we write, how is that connected to the cadence of our voice? And this kind of gets back to like us, our, our, how we speak uh, and how what is stitched even is an extension of our bodies. Ian, what was, what did you think of? Uh, I, I, I had such a pleasant time. Um, <laughs> you know, like shout out to, um, uh, Andrea Hanley and um, <laughs> Southwest Contemporary, you know, like they that they were they were awesome as well. Um, but yeah, like being able to sit sit at this like uh, series of tables that essentially just created one long communal table, you know, um, and then sharing conversation with individuals. Um, and I'm a complete novice. Like I, I mean, I think I've only like stitched a few few of even that like items in my life so like sitting down and again challenging myself and um uh, Felicia Garcia you know was with with me as well and then I think the both of you had, had talked about uh, Willamette you know times and and <laughs> and the mutual like you know it was like it was like this beautiful like you know exchange of conversation um and 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 work towards like this you know grander vision um doesn't get much better than that you know and the fact that I get to like um walk away with you know like a, a print from you it was like the the ones that you did on the plates you know and so okay. uh yeah. those yeah like those are framed in, in our kitchen you know like so i always get to sort of relive <laughs> that you know that experience it was such a such an incredible time yeah. yeah thanks for those reflections i mean i think one thing that happens when a piece gets further assembled in my studio i too also remember the conversations that happen over a piece. And so for me, a mm -hmm. piece isn't something finished on the wall. It's like the sewing circles in themselves are kind of this 
this uh, um, action that's produced by everybody who was there. And, you know, there's no pressure to talk, but stories flow when you're working with something as intimate as cloth. And I'm glad that you reminded me about police because, you know, you also realize that there's people in the room that you have something in common with that you didn't mm -hmm. know. And I think it's an opportunity for, for friends and strangers and neighbors all to kind of come together. And, and typically what happens is you locate uh, connection. And uh, another thing that Ian said is uh, in regards to your sewing experience, Ian, like some of my favorite stitchers, all of my favorite stitchers are people who don't have a lot of sewing experience because the marks are more expressive than um, a, a person who maybe has, has stitched a lot. And mm -hmm. those marks are really beautiful too, but the, I think the end pieces become this amazing sampler of like everybody's hand that's so different and unique. Right, and so that was the other thing as well, is like you you, uh, you asked us to write in our own hand and I'm a lefty, I'm lefty strong. <laughs> and so my handwriting is terrible. I'm like, you know, like over, over with this giant, like, you know, uh, chisel tip marker, like trying, <laughs> trying to write and then like trying to figure out in my head. I mean, I was, in the beginning, I was a, a little intimidated, but again, like stepping into that environment where everybody was just having a great time and the energy was pleasant and everybody was super supportive, engaging in conversation. Yeah, it was, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't get much better than that. No. And how, um, how do you see those going forward in this, in this period of time that we're in where we're joining together and, and, you know, being in a room with, um, you know, 20 other people is ill-advised. <laughs> <laughs> for the time being until everyone you know can safely gather again but you know how how has that impacted you know specifically your practice Marie but also the work that you do Ian and just this time of sheltering in place and not being able to to travel freely the same way or go go and gather with others I I totally miss the gathering part and I actually struggle with zoom as a tool you're making it very natural for all of us in this moment but i'm um not really as natural or comfortable with this uh tool same the one thing i actually <laughs> love about the sewing circles in person is that i feel like our lives and so many so so many of our relationships are mediated by technology these days that we don't have opportunities to gather and know our neighbors in the way we used to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in some ways the pandemic is actually allow, like encouraging us to know our neighbors again because we really aren't going that far. We're not traveling far. Um, I have tried a little bit. I've experimented with sending things out and having them sent back to me. Mm -hmm. um, I've done some Zoom sewing circles. The most recent one was with Emily Carr uh, institute or university. And, and that was very fun. And, but I think part of the thing that works so well with that particular sewing circle is that there were 22 people and it was, and we could all be on the same page and like kind of have a conversation. I've noticed in the larger sewing circles, if there's like 125 people present with, for example, when Chnupa Hanska Luger and I hosted a sewing circle with the Denver art museum, then it just becomes much more, um, uh, I, the feeling for me was chaotic, but maybe if you were in a Zoom room with a set group of people, it w it might not have been quite quite that. So I, I couldn't do your, that sewing circle thing with you because I can't thread my own needles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll have so, to provide those in a, I, I, I would the care package. Okay, I know, to, <laughs> <laughs> I know what to send you. <laughs> oh goodness! Well, um, I me? guess. Oh, sorry. But yeah, I oh, uh, yeah, no, for me, for me um, I, I sort of work in, um, in solitude to begin with, you know, like the, the practice of hand cut paper is a very intimate thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, and even like the, the land art that I do um, is, is pretty, pretty solid. It's, it's a solitary act mostly. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I miss, I miss, spending time like gathering with people to speak about, you know, other things and maybe uh, current projects or, you know, process um, and how, like what direction individuals are moving in their own minds and, and their bodies to create things. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's a, the pandemic hasn't really affected me 
too much short of like maybe travel or feeling weary of stepping outside to, to compose a like land art piece because of like possible, you know, interaction with somebody or, you know, and mm. jeopardizing somebody else's health. I mean, it's also one of the reasons why I haven't gone back to Hawaii, you know, um, as well. I mean, um, because of because of the pandemic. Um, For sure. And that's that's about it. Just more so like health and and being concerned about the well-being of others, not so much about, you know, I guess myself. Absolutely. But taking that conscious role in understanding, you know, the role that we play in not only protecting ourselves and our loved ones, but but larger communities, um, mm -hmm. both in terms of the pandemic and also the way in which we work and and create work and interact and collaborate with one another, you know, having that consciousness of um, are we helping or are we hurting is, I think, really, really important. Um, so I guess at this point, I'll ask Felicia and Molly if we have any questions from the those out there in, in TV land. <laughs> All right, I'll chime back in here. And just a reminder to our viewers, if you have a question or a comment, please type it in the chat box on the right. We have received a few, um, and one of them actually aligned with one of the questions that I already had. So I'll just start with that one. Um, I really loved watching from Instagram, actually, the installation process of this exhibit. It was so cool to me to see Aaron, you posting as well as all of the different artists traveling to the museum to install their works. And I'm just curious about um, like if either the artists or Aaron, if you can speak about the potential roles of artists in exhibition development and how this type of um, collaborative um, work can challenge the traditional way that museums function. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Me? <laughs> They're both pointing at me. Um, well, you know, in, in terms of the, the way in which museums function, I think we can all agree that there are many ways in which museums function that need to change <laughs> um, a lot of ways. Um, and I think for, for me as a, a curator, you know, I didn't um, start my career in museums. I started my work as an independent and then um, you know, sort of grew into the museum world. So, you know, I've always, I guess because of that, my work has always been focused more on collaboration and working with the artists than working as an agent of the institution. Um, you know, so when, you know, speaking with Marie about the project and really understanding, you know, what her thoughts were about the exhibition and, and what work we thought would fit well, or when, you know, we, um, talk to Ian about commissioning the pieces for the arches, you know, it was really, what do you want to do, you know, and how can, I think it's figuring out how we as museum workers can be a support to these artists that we're inviting into the space and, and sharing space with and not necessarily prescribing what that is, but figuring out how we can support it first and foremost. Someone else's turn. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Ian. Did I cut you oh, off? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, yeah, I wasn't aware that are we all chiming in on this conversation or is it just like are we moving on to another question? Whatever you feel like you well, want I'm, to contribute. I'm, I'm cool with the next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, we actually had a question specifically directed at you here. Um, uh -oh. Sandra okay. Adamson <laughs> has typed in the question box, Ian, aloha, interested in the choice and meaning of Oli and who chanted mahalo? Um, that was one of the haumana of um, my mother's uh, good friend, uh, late great Kumu uh, John Keola Lake. Um, I, right now my brain is kind of like scrambled, so I can't like, I have like a million Hawaiian names and words running through my head right now. Um, it's actually in the credits for um, and I don't want to do them a disservice by not remembering who did the Oli, you know, <laughs> because, um, but yeah, they're, they're in, um, in the credits for the video. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have can apologized. You, can you talk a little bit more about your choice to overlay that chant on your time-lapse video? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I felt like it was um, necessary to, again, like bring our voice and our chant into the equation. You know, um, we have a monarch present, you know, who we could trace our genealogies basically back to the origins and like what Marie was saying about how like us being like the youngest of the relatives, like, you know, like if we go to the Kumulipo and our origin story, you know, we are like the youngest, but I wanted to like have um, other, other deities and, and, and other, other elite like present at the time, you know what I mean? Like during the portion of the time lapse, I, I felt like I could have just like had my brother compose, I don't know, like some sort of Hawaiian slack key guitar composition specifically for it, but to create like more of an atmosphere of, um, of, of proper representation of our deities and, uh, and our ali'i for that piece was, was ideal, you know? Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, it looks so, it's such a beautiful video with the chant. So I was glad that we got to share that. Right, I feel so bad that I don't remember um, remember uh, the Kumu's name right now. Um, and but Laura, they, do, they have, um, and it's on the tip of my tongue because they also have a, a store in Wailuku on, on the island of Maui um, called Native in Intelligence. Hmm. And so, um, um, yeah. Anyway, I, I feel it's so okay. terrible. Uh, Molly uh, copy and pasted the link to the the time lapse and put it in the chat here. So Thank please you, feel Molly. free to click on that link and watch it. And all the credits are there. Um, and then Laura Sullivan also commented that the, it was really powerful the chant and did create an um, the atmosphere that you were striving for. Let's see, sorry, we've got a lot of questions that came in just recently. So this one is from an anonymous attendee. They are asking, um, the Native Art Museum, Art Slash Museum world can sometimes be tough to break into and competitive. How do the panelists go about their professional realms handling this and finding kinship? It's a great question. Marie, do you want to do you want to chime in on this one first or? Um, I feel like This is a hard moment, actually, because we can't because we can't gather. I think that it's um, harder to build the community that will be an important um, support system for you to make those um, broader connections with uh, museums and art institutions. I mean, I think for all young artists, it's important to find any opportunity to exhibit your work. And that can start at coffee shops and group shows. And, um, you know, I know the artist, Jim Lavador, his first show was literally a nail, like, like on the side of his house. Like he basically hung up paintings on the side of his house. Um, I can share that for myself, like one place that had been really, for me, what was, transformative in my career was a symposium that was held at Crow Shadow Institute of the Arts. And it's where I met a lot of indigenous artists and curators at that time. Um, and so I, I hope that you can find that community. And I think that it's by kind of um, uh, building friendships and connections and, and dare I say even like net, networking, which I think is a, a loaded a loaded word, but I, I think that it can it can happen and, and be patient and, and just keep working. Ian, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with um, everything that you've mentioned. Um, for me personally, you know, um, I came from, from essentially taking space illegally you know what I mean as like a graffiti writer or somebody who's out there in the streets um or out there in public you know um writing on walls and so um I had to make like a, a strange weird sort of conscious decision and I got a lot of backlash from from the hip-hop and graffiti writing community from you know making that leap I like you know you, you always get called like a sellout or what have you you know what I mean but for me I saw like this other direction and unfortunately a lot of my my mentors the people that um 
that that are essentially like the first and second generation of you know cultural hip hop and and graffiti writing or style writing um, would always encourage me. They would they would always be like you you do work you know uh, about your culture. Focus a lot on that. You know, put a lot of energy and attention towards that. I mean, you you're still connected to us, but you know this is like this is what it is. You know, like create a create a marriage between the two. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean you know you do have to be patient with yourself. It just, it, you know, for some people, it does happen overnight. For other individuals, it takes much longer. I mean, I come from like the graffiti side of things where I'm directly connected to some individuals that are super iconic individuals, you know, in, in art history. Will I ever achieve that? Who knows, you know? Is it important to me personally? No, not really. You know, the, the, what's important for me is to actually make the work and continue to make the work regardless of how like beat down I may feel by society or, you know, um, try to congratulate like both emerging and, uh, you know, established artists on even their smallest su successes, you know? Um, I, I try to, with emerging artists, I try to be as encouraging as possible too by purchasing their works, you know, now, you know, now. Um, because I know that they require that money for them to, you know, continue uh, continue their practice. Um, I even encourage them and send them like opportunities. You know, if there's a grant or a residency or a fellowship or something, like send that information to them. The ones that you you uh, see super promising, like help them. You know what I mean? Like be there, be be available for them. You know. Um, and again, that was like another thing that I learned from from hip hop, like. You know, like a lot of the people that uh, that sort of brought me up in hip hop or belong to the 5% nation of, you know, Islam. And so they believe in like each one teach one practices, you know. Um, and so like from you just uh, like giving energy to one individual, that one individual will hopefully go and, you know, do the same. And it'll continue the cycle of, of, uh, of individuals showing support and love and, you know, um, offering being of service, you know, so. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Just be patient with yourself. Thank you. I, th I think you both do an incredible job of building and supporting community and holding space for other Native artists and community members. So oh, thank also, you for sharing. Yeah, also don't, don't forget to like be kind to yourself and rest. Seriously, Definitely. like, you know, never, that's, that's super important, you know? And you'll hear people or you'll see people post things like, you know, um, I'll sleep when I'm dead, kind of like stuff. Like to me, that conversation's dead. Like be kind and gentle with yourself. You know what I mean? Like you're in this for the long haul. Like you're not in it just to like, you know, get it immediately and then like burn out. Like be kind to yourself. You have an important voice an important like practice to share with the world. Give yourself some time. That's great advice, thank you. Um, let's see. So this this question is related to some of the things that you all were just touching on. Um, but what about COVID um, impacted or what about COVID impacts and the reception of this exhibition? Was the exhibition intended to reach specific audiences who might have been unable to engage with this exhibit like nearby indigenous communities? I think um... COVID, I mean, very clearly, obviously impacted this exhibition, um, even just from, you know, before even talking about audience, just from the sort of logistical side of things, the exhibition was originally scheduled to open in May, and, you know, everything was on lockdown. Um, you know, we were all, you know, here at the museum, we were all working remotely, the museum was closed. Uh, we were still trying to make sure we could get artwork here and we weren't at that point even sure when the exhibition would open. We had thought, oh, well, maybe by the summer things will be safer. And then it was, you know, let's try for fall. And, you know, even then it, um, like I said earlier, really presented challenges just about getting the artwork here. Because as I said, there were ex or, um, artworks in the exhibition from uh, Canada from institutions in Canada. One loan uh, that was intended for the exhibition got canceled because of COVID. Uh, one piece of art uh, by Mike Patton in the exhibition actually got 
turned away at the border when Canada was closing down. Um, and luckily we were able to, to get it eventually, um, but just you know, from a very practical logistical side, it, it definitely impacted um, the schedule and the availability of certain artworks. Um, we had you know, to follow and still follow very strict guidelines on safety for you know us as, as museum workers, for the artists that came in. We had Ian here, uh, we had Eric Paul Rige here, uh, Chinupa Hans Galuger uh, came uh, with Ginger Dunnell and installed his work um, and just making sure that number one, that they felt safe traveling um, and that we were making sure they were staying in hotels that were following safe guidelines and, um, you know, so there were, there. we always want to make sure that we're taking care of the artists that we work with, but there's was this extra layer of let's not get anybody hurt or sick um, during, during this time. Um, attendance was impacted for sure. You know, I think a lot of people were not as comfortable going out into public, uh, you know, Arizona, especially uh, last summer and then last fall, we had two big surges of cases. Um, and as we all know, indigenous communities have been much more impacted uh, and especially indigenous communities. You know, Navajo Nation had, you know, huge numbers. Some of the highest per capita numbers in the country uh, were here um, in Arizona and New Mexico. So the, you know, the reality of people feeling safe and not wanting to go into an indoor space, um, you know, was, was evident in the fact that we, I think we were down 50%, 60% for what would normally be an, an attendance number for the, for the show. Um, that being said, we did get, um, you know, considering it was a global pandemic, we, <laughs> we felt pretty, good about the number of people who did come and you know we, we're still limiting attendance to a um, certain number of, of individuals per hour and um, we're not doing school tours right now we're not which has been a big shift because you know the education side of an institution is so important and making sure that you're bringing in children um, to have access and families to have access because I think a lot of you know back to things that museums need to change they often feel like very elitist institutions, institutions that aren't accessible um, to diverse communities. So really making that free access is important. And I will say uh, we did uh, move forward with doing some of our free access evenings during the exhibition to make sure that that um, entry was available for people for whom cost may be a barrier. Um, so that was, important and it was we were a little nervous at first about number one are people even going to come <laughs> um, if we stay open late and then um, making sure to stay on top of of safety guidelines because I think in the evening sometimes people feel like oh like you know it's more fun you know we had um, an yeah. what people like to tend to be a bit more relaxed yeah exactly um, you know so making sure even though we wanted to create like a a joyful atmosphere. We had an indigenous DJ come and um, made sure that he was stanchioned off so people couldn't, you know, get too close to to him. And or even when Ian was installing, we, he was like behind stanchions so people couldn't um, swarm. You let, have, you let me have a face shield too. So I was like mask, face shield. Yeah. Man, <laughs> you know, We're all so. walking around in space suits, but, um, totally. you know, it's definitely, I think, just in terms of how we operate in a safety capacity, it's required a lot more nimbleness um, about how do we, you know, it's sort of assess and adapt constantly um, as things changed and continue to change um, with the impact of the, of the virus. Sorry, that was a really long, long winded response. No, that was great. And I think you answered this next question from Manny Ramirez, which was, Will museums support educational events that complement the exhibition in the future? Um, and I think you spoke to that, but I'm curious about um, for both Aaron and Marie, how the pandemic has kind of challenged you to take things online and whether that has created uh, new opportunities. Do you wanna go first? <laughs> Oh, I, I mean, I can go if you want me to go first. <laughs> um, well, I guess for, for <laughs> oh, the sorry. museum. 
Oh, sorry, you keep cutting out. You go first. Me? Okay. <laughs> um, for the museum, it's it's like it obviously very much changed. You know, like I said, we're not doing school tours um, because large groups aren't you know safe to have right now. And you know, we've been in the practice for several years now um, doing. Uh, family galleries that are sort of um, hands-on interpretations of whatever sort of the, the big show is in the main gallery. So um, we've done it for, I think, six or seven exhibitions now. And we did a really fun one for, for Larger Than Memory. We had, I mean, it's still downstairs installed, just the gallery is closed, but we had uh, worked with several artists in the exhibition, including Nani Chacon and Louis DeSoto and Jeffrey Gibson and Merrill McMaster to create like line drawings of all of their work. And then those were on iPads where, you know, children and adults could color them in and like email them to themselves. And um, we had different uh, art books for children and like building blocks and things where they could kind of mimic artworks in, in the show. But unfortunately that's, you know, just sitting there no one ever got to use it. Um, we did develop a, uh, we've also been in the process of developing curriculum for different exhibitions. And I think specifically it's important for us to, and we've been doing more both for adults and for children uh, for contemporary art uh, because we haven't you know, done historically as much contemporary art as more um, historic materials. So creating those resources, which is available online instead of publishing it and uh, going to the you know expense of printing something that can't be recycled in, t in so much not of like obviously we could recycle the paper but can't be reused by someone else um, so we've des designed a curriculum that adheres to state um, education guidelines that kind of goes into different artworks in the show um, I think I'm, I might be the only one but I, I hate zoom <laughs> I'm probably not the only one, but like Zoom panels are so weird to me and we've been doing a lot of them during the exhibition and for other exhibitions and it's, you know, it's a great resource, but I think we all miss being in a room together and feeling each other's energy. Um, it, it doesn't come through as well on, on Zoom and there's inevitably going to be like, you know, a, a glitch or technical difficulty, but um, it is a nice resource that we have. Uh, to use. I just hope that we don't have to use it forever. <laughs> in my studio, I feel like things in some ways, I definitely when there was the initial lockdown, I felt very um, uh, concerned about what the way forward would be. But then maybe after a month or so, I um, just kind of continued to dig in. And I suppose the fact that uh, I'm not working in a congested space, you know, made that possible. The, the fact that our offices are our studio, uh, artists offices are our studios, I think has kind of allowed me in some ways to stay um, sane. And then I also had, um, well, I was very sorry that the larger than memory panel discussion was created or the symposium, um, because that was an event that like, not only does a show like what Aaron curated create um, an important conversation about about the work, but then to bring artists together to um, interact and have an exchange and um, meet one another, because of course we all haven't necessarily met one another before. To have that opportunity um, is something that I really missed, but I, I have otherwise been just like kind of working on other projects. And so I, in October, delivered work for my first um, show in, New York at the Mark Strauss Gallery. And I think the hard part, of course, with that is almost like what happened with this show is like it gets mounted, but then the amount of people who actually um, come and see it is incredibly limited. But I still, um, it was still felt good to have made that work and for it to be um, in, in the universe. <laughs> How about you, Ian? What about me? 
<laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just, again, like I'm kind of just a solitary individual anyway. So it's like, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just like, you, like you said, like the office space is the office space. I'm here in the dirty dungeon, just creating, you know, all the time. It hasn't really affected me all that much, except for like my concern as far as health stuff. I mean, that's what this, that's what we're on, right? As far as like the topic. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's not, it hasn't really, I do miss again, like that engagement, you know, the symposium would have been incredible. All of us like being able to, um, meet at the actual exhibition itself during opening day would have been incredible. Um, but I'm sure that in the future, you know, with us all being uh, cautious about the way that we operate in our personal lives, you know, and, um, and hopefully these, these vaccines just like, you know, start lowering the number of cases so we can, we can all meet again, you know, I'm excited for all that. Um, Yes, me too. I wish this event could be taking place in person on our campus. I know, some... right? I mean, that beautiful campus. Hopefully next year. Right. All right. And Marie, we have some fans of your t-shirt in the audience. They would like to know if it's available for <laughs> sale. Well, not that specific one, but if folks can get your the similar shirt online. Thank you. I I like my t-shirt too. And now we're gonna need like something that says lead like uh, Deb Holland. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I unfortunately, I don't know where to get it. I, ha I met somebody um, a couple of years ago from Canada and th she told me that they were selling these uh, shirts to support an indigenous girls camp. And so I purchased it. And I have to say, I feel like the shirt is my talisman and it's sort of this shield. I um, come out and uh, I, I like to wear. And my husband was just saying recently, he's like, we're gonna have to get you another one of those because you're gonna wear, <laughs> you're gonna wear it out. But anyway, um, I appreciate the fans of the t-shirt. Uh, if, you, if you purchase one, send me your photo in it and um, we, can, we can post ourselves together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I love that. I'm like, I need one of those shirts too, it's great. <laughs> I know, as soon as somebody finds it, put it in the chat box. <laughs> yeah. Quick Googling. All right, so, um, <laughs> Ian, I'll get you one too, don't Quick worry. <laughs> um, all right, we have a couple more questions here in the chat. Um, let's see, this one is for Ian. John asks or says, I'm fascinated by Ian's story about his mother's long-term work on monuments and their message. Perhaps he can talk a bit more about how much that influences his work as it seems to have done with his piece at the herd. All right, so to clarify, it's not, um, my mother didn't, it's not like so much long-term works as far as monuments. Um, my mother has been a, a cultural worker for like some decades now, also worked in native health still works for Native Health. She, um, she's currently, uh, I believe sits on the committee, the national committee for like HIV AIDS and hepatitis for, for, the, na for native the Native community. Um, she recently just presented something, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be saying this, but she just recently presented something for like the Biden administration. Uh, but yeah, my mother's, uh, she's sacred, my sacred mother is an incredible individual and has done a lot of work. And I'm sorry, what was the other portion of that question? Or, sorry, I'm muted here. Let me go back to it. Um, talk a bit, if you could talk a bit more about the work that your mother does and how that might have um, impacted the work that you created for the Herd Museum. Okay. So just in general, like the work that my mother has done over numerous decades is, it always stands as like the largest inspiration for me, um, whether it be, you know, in native health or um, advocating for global indigenous rights, um, you know, uh, helping, helping amplify like emerging indigenous artists or creators or, you know, individuals that are cultural practitioners even. 
Um, she has a, a nonprofit organization called Kua Aina Associates. And uh, I mean, she, for the Native Arts and Culture, uh, Cultures Foundation and uh, the National Endowment for the Arts recently, I think it was like last year in February, I wanna say, had a, um, uh, like a gathering in Washington, DC, I believe it was. And my mother sat on the advisory for that. And so it's like, you know, my mother is consistently doing, doing this incredible work um, and, and inspiring me, you know, to, to, to help amplify other individuals' voices and our history. And so, yeah, I mean, all of that, all of the work that I create is, um, you know, she's my mom, she gave birth to me. Everything that I create is like all due to her, you know what I mean? And the individuals that she has access to, like the great aunts and uncles and Mana Mahu and Mana Wahines, you know, and, and, and uh, Mana Wahine in Hawaii and Hawaii that, um, you know, like we consistently have the honor and privilege of having conversation with and building with, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, she, you know, she, she curated the exhibition that was geared around uh, the removal of that early days portion of the monument in San Francisco um, for the San Francisco Art Commission um, and was part of that whole group of individuals. But to, she doesn't specifically just focus on, um, on monument, problematic monument removal or conversations around it. She does have conversations in regards to it, but it's not her primary, primary work. Great, thank you. Um, we have a really good question from Emily Santanam, who's one of the Anne Wright interns at the Indian Arts Research Center. Emily um, says, I'm wondering if the artist could talk more about how ritual informs their practice. In what ways does the, that meditative process help you to navigate the very rare, real physical and emotional labor involved in producing your art? Um, ritual, I mean, that's kind of like, a, for me, a, like a loaded word. Um, because for me, like, uh, there's like, I don't really dance unless it's like ritual dance, like dance for ceremony. Like I always say, like, I only dance for the goddesses and the gods, right? Um, and when creating my work, I have to be super, um, well now be super conscious about like what I put out there um, and what I'm representing. Um, you know, a lot of the individuals that I do portrait work of are, um, you know, people doing like frontline work or individuals that are considered like sacred individuals in our culture, you know? Um, and so like, I mean, I guess like ritual and ceremony and, uh, and those things are always, they always have to be present in the process. Um, and I always tell individuals too, like, um, where I have told individuals in the past that when composing a cut paper piece, like there's times where I literally just sit in front of like a blank sheet of paper and it could be like days, weeks without cutting anything or even, you know, composing anything or drafting anything up. Uh, like it all has to feel like right, you know, like the, it's weird, like the paper has to tell me it's okay, like when it's time to do it, or the blade actually has to command my movement. And like breath and movement are all like super important to the process as well and making sure that all of the cultural and spiritual elements are kind of in play and in place in, in this proper space. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, they're all highly, highly important to me. Yeah. Alicia, can you restate um, the question again? Yes, definitely. Let me pull it up here. All right, so this is the question. Um, I'm wondering if the artist could talk more about how ritual informs their practice. In what ways does that meditative process help you to navigate the very real physical and emotional labor involved in producing your art? I often wish, wish that um, I was more um, uh, ordered or, or structured and that there was more ritual in my practice but I do think that when I um, 
eventually like come to a piece and 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 really sort of dig in then uh and kind of especially moving it toward completion i think it's it's about being present with the work but i don't know that i can comment as much and i do think that i don't know that i seek i don't think i'm seeking ritual but i think that there's there's um something that happens with process oriented work that is very um, ritualistic, if that makes if that makes sense. Um, Marie, do you do you experience it too? Like when you're when you're in like that creative state, and say it's like you're in your creative like place, right, alone. Like there's no there's no other people around, um, and you're you're like just going you're going through it, right? Do you have a hard time um, re like engaging with humans like afterward for like a specific amount of time, or are you? Are you good with that? Because I find that like, if I'm like working and I'm like deep into it, as soon as like I break any kind of like, you know, chain, like, or, you know, focus on the work itself. And I go back into like, I guess the ordinary world, like I have a hard time speaking with people or just, you know, being human <laughs> again, you know? Yeah. I, I actually, um, I'm probably both a social creature and then um, there's just uh, responsibilities with being a parent and, and other things that I think that the, my response is to, to work out being present for that next the, that next thing, um, but- so you're, not, you're, never, you're never like, get out of here, kid, you bother me. Like, <laughs> well- <right? Like> <laughs> I mean, for the <laughs> pandemic, for all the parents during the pandemic, I mean, I think that that's, and people sharing, sharing that intimate space. I'm actually at my studio and uh, it's my husband, Adam, who is at home with our nine-year-old and 16-year-old. And I think that that is a, a yet another dynamic that marks this, this moment. So um yeah, funny enough, I mean, I almost feel like I do crave the adult interaction uh, or, you know, conversations. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't experience that same thing. Although I kind yeah. of wish I did. It's, I don't know. It's like, I, I think sometimes I upset people <laughs> when it happens because like, I don't, you know what I mean? It's like, a, a, like all social graces are gone, you know, like it's, it's bizarre. It's like a bizarre place to be in. Yeah. Um, so if anybody has any advice, put it in the chat section of how to like, you know, um, get beyond that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, again, like you, it's, it's totally, I mean, you, you know, you, you have children, you have a family, you know, so yeah. Having to jump back into that is, yeah, a huge responsibility as well, so. Thank you for your responses. Um, it looks like someone or Christina Burke shared the link for the shirt, but unfortunately the fundraiser is has closed, but maybe they'll be available in the future. Right, just contact them and be like, do another, do another run. <laughs> um, and one of the perks of being a moderator is I get to have my own questions. So I have one for Erin. Um, I love the title of this exhibition, which I know um, comes from a Joy Harjo poem. I would love to hear more about um, the choice to use that line as the title and then uh, what your vision or intention was for the exhibition kind of in the initial stages. For sure. Um, yeah, so the, the title comes from, um, as you said, a, a Joy Harjo poem uh, called Grace. And uh, the, it's at the end of the poem, um, the line is, we know that there is something larger than the memory of a dispossessed people. We have seen it. And when my co-curator and I, as well as museum director, um, were trying to think of what to call the show. And I think that's something that's always uh, really hard, even as a, as a writer, um, you know, writing for different art journals. I think like maybe twice the title that I've given an article that I've written has actually been used. They're like, no, that's not catchy enough. Um, uh, but for exhibition titles, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the sort of handshake that the, the show has with an audience before they ever see it. 
um, and it kind of creates that ethos around the show. And it was really, you know, sort of the, the crux of the show for me was um, to create a, a means to like dislodge and unsettle um, these very narrow um, ideas of what indigenous art was. You know, I think especially when you think about a place like the Heard Museum and many people may have come here for a field trip uh, when they were in, in grade school. Um, and then, you know, you people are like, oh, but I haven't been back since. And they think about it in a very, um, which is, sort of inaccurate, but they think about it in a sort of fixed, um, historical, more anthropological sense, um, as opposed to an institution that's working with living artists um, and artists that aren't necessarily making work that fits that sort of colonial lens of what Native art is supposed to look like. You know, I think we get a lot of that um, from some viewers or they think that they're coming to see a certain visual um, experience and you know with works like in larger than memory we have you know Marie's textile installation we have Ian's um, cut vinyl and cut paper pieces we had uh, sculpture installation by Brian Youngen and Elisa Harkins and video work by Laura Ortman and Nana Becker um, that really sort of unhinge those colonial stereotypes of native art um, and the the show is very uh, was very, I, I'm talking like it's still downstairs. Um, so it's, it's weird not having all that work here now. Um, but it was focused on a very specific portion of time from the year 2000 to 2020 and wanting to look at how artists from those communities have made such important contributions to the global contemporary art world. Um, and it was also really important when we first began planning the show uh, to have a lot of diversity in the exhibition, both um, of artists from different um, nations and tribes, but also different lived experiences from people who live and work in their community, people who live in more urban settings, and also artists at very different stages of their career. Um, you know, we have Jean Quick to see Smith in this exhibition, who's 81 and has this, you know, hugely impressive six decade career. Uh, in the contemporary art world. And then we have, you know, very emerging artists like Eric Paul Rige, who's I think 26, <laughs> 27. And- um, Right, he just had his know, birthday, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it is very much just beginning that, that journey in, in the art world. Um, you know, so I think it's, at least in, in my opinion, I think it's dangerous as a curator to say we had a specific outcome or a specific, I like very fixed idea in mind, but you know, that was sort of the, the armature that we were wanting to create. And then, you know, working with the different artists and talking to them about what artwork they wanted to show and, you know, how it was to be installed and making sure that they were included in the didactic process that they were approving everything that was written about them, both on the exhibition microsite, in the in the catalog, in the the wall labels, and and having a lot of inclusivity throughout the journey was also really important. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, that just I feel like that really nicely kind of sums up the what we've been talking about today. Um, I'm so I'm just going to start winding down here, but I wanted to share. Uh, my colleague Meredith just reminded me that SAR is going to be hosting Joy Harjo on April 28th at 2 p.m. So we'll share the link to register for that later uh, this week. That was kind of a seamless plug that I wasn't even thinking about. <laughs> shout, but, out to, uh, shout out to Auntie Joy Harjo. <laughs> you know, huge connection in Hawaii. Like, yeah, musicians out there like would play jazz with my, my Hanai uncle, Gene um, Argel, and like a bunch of other people. So like shout out to that saxophone, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are so excited to host uh, Joy Harjo. And I think it'll be definitely like a continuation of some of the things that we discussed today. So definitely tune in for that if you can. Um, and then I wanted to end with some of these like really nice comments that we received here in the chat. Um, let me see. Um, someone comments, Ian, I would love to see your work showing at the Bishop Museum someday. I would love that as well. Kamalu, make that happen. 
<laughs> um, John comments, thanks so very much for an enriching and thought provoking session today. Um, Sandra comments, thank you all for the thoughtful and inspirational presentation. And I would just have to echo that. I think this has been such a wonderful, insightful conversation. And I'm so appreciative um, for you all taking the time to join us today. And so um, if you guys have any like last comments or um, things that you wanna end on, um, please feel free to share. I just want to thank you, Felicia, uh, so much for organizing this and to Molly for working on the back end of the Zoom that's, you know, way beyond my technical abilities <laughs> as a um, digital neophyte. So um, thank you so much for that. And thank you, Ian and Marie, for being in the exhibition and going on that journey in the middle of a global health crisis with, <laughs> with me and, and for being here and being so open with your responses today. Thank you. All right, I think that's a wrap then. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, to our viewers, please tune in next Wednesday at 2 p.m. for the third event in our IRC speaker series. Um, so we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.